Welcome to the third week of the BBC course. In the previous weeks, we have learned about different forms of parallelism that we have in CPUs. Now we will try to put all three forms of parallelism in use simultaneously. Let us first recall what forms of parallelism they are. Throughout these lectures, we have used this specific Intel CPU as a running example, Skylake Microarchitecture from 2015. This is a CPU that you might find, for example, inside an iMac and many other desktop computers. And let's try to multiply floating point numbers with this CPU. As we have learned in the first week, it turns out that we can have as many as 256 such operations in progress at any given moment. There are four CPU cores, and in every clock cycle, each core can initiate two such operations. And the arithmetic units are pipelined, so even if it takes four cycles for one operation to complete, we can start new operations at each clock cycle. And finally, by using vector instructions, one instruction can do eight multiplications in parallel. In part 2a, we learned to use OpenMP to create multiple threads so that we can benefit from multiple CPU cores. In part 1d, we learned about instruction level parallelism which makes it possible to benefit from pipeline superscalar execution units. And in part 2b, we learned about vector operations. We have seen that efficient use of multiple cores can be as easy as adding just one OpenMP primer. We just have to be careful to make sure there are no data races. If one thread is writing to some data elements, no other thread can read or write the same element. We have seen that instruction level parallelism is, at least in principle, a simple concept. You write your code so that they are independent operations. The CPU will then figure out how to keep the pipelines in all execution units as busy as possible. And we have learned about how to write C++ code that makes use of vector operations. You can just use vector types, write A plus B or A times B or something similar, and the compiler will generate the right machine language instructions that do several similar operations in parallel. So is this all that there is to parallel programming? Is it enough? to just put all three ideas into use, and you have got the fastest possible program for the CPU. Let's start with a toy example. We want to simulate the following iterative process. We start with some input value C, we initialize x to zero, and then we repeatedly calculate what is x squared plus C and this is the new value of x. We repeat this for n times and see what is the final value of x. So, for example, if c is 0.2 and n is 5, the result is apparently approximately 0.271. And we want to calculate this for some huge value of n. We want to do it for 512 different input values, input 0, input 1, etc. And we want to store the answer into result 0, result 1, etc. Now, if you think about the task of calculating one result, there doesn't seem to be any room for parallelism. Every single multiply and add operation depends on the result of the previous multiply and add operation. However, if you look at the task of calculating two such results, you get completely independent operations. So there is at least potential 
for doing all 512 calculations in parallel. So let's see what happens if we try to do that. Let's first write the simple sequential solution. Completely straightforward, no parallelism yet. Now, all iterations of the outermost loop are independent, so it is trivial to parallelize it with OpenMP. Let's do that now, just one primer. Now, all CPU cores are doing something useful. But each core is still doing only sequential work. So instead of calculating only one result per step, we can calculate eight results in an interleaved manner. This way, there is all the time plenty of room for instruction level parallelism. We need to add some extra code to initialize everything and gather the final results. But the original basic idea is still there. Note that the outermost loop only needs to do 64 iterations, as each iteration calculates 8 results. Now, all CPU cores should be busy executing instructions as fast as possible. But currently, all of these instructions are doing only scalar operations. We would like to benefit from vector operations. So let's go further and calculate 8 by 8 results in one step. We keep the intermediate results in 8 vector variables, each wide enough to hold 8 results. Not a big change in the code if our input and result are kept in vector form. Now the outermost loop only needs to take 8 iterations, as each iteration calculates 8 by 8 results. So now we have got our fully parallelized solution, able to benefit from multiple CPU cores, superscalar pipeline arithmetic units, and vector operations. Is it fast? Let's benchmark. Let's say n is 1 billion. Now in each step we will do two arithmetic operations, one multiplication and one addition. And they are 512 input values, so overall we will do 1024 billion arithmetic operations. So how long does it take? When I tried it out on our favorite CPU, it finished in 2.44 seconds. So we managed to do 420 billion arithmetic operations per second. A pretty impressive number for a normal desktop CPU. So are we happy? Let's go to check the marketing material and see what's the maximum arithmetic throughput of the CPU. If you do everything right, keep the arithmetic units busy all the time, then you can do at best 422 billion operations per second. So we are extremely close to using all computing resources of the CPU. So yes, we are happy. So are we done now with nothing else to learn? Unfortunately, this toy example was really tailored so that it is easy to achieve a good performance. First, we were doing arithmetic operations that are really easy for modern CPUs. The CPUs have even got a special instruction for doing a multiplication and addition. But this is not the key point. The key point is that we had a tiny input and tiny output. They were very few memory accesses. Everything in the critical inner loops was done using local variables, which can be kept easily in the CPU registers. If you had just a single memory access in the innermost loop, the performance would immediately drop. The CPU would be just mostly idle, waiting for some data to arrive from the memory. 
So what to do then? If you need to read some input data from the memory, how can you still achieve a good performance? These are not easy questions, but in the next parts we will see some answers.